Pork Shop for the Ridgecrest Earthquake. City Manager of Ridgecrest, Ron Strand is going to get the clock. Get the clock on. Great. Uh, thank you for uh, for inviting us to uh, give you a debrief on our uh, earthquake or the earthquakes that, w that uh, we had in Ridgecrest on July 4th and July 5th of this year. Um, as you know, it was quite challenging. It's one of those uh, uh, very uh, rare but high risk events that every every city uh, kind of uh, is afraid that's that's going to happen within their jurisdiction. Uh, we happened to have it on a holiday, um, and it was uh, extremely uh, challenging for us. And, and I brought my uh, chief, Jed McLaughlin, with me this evening. And he's going to lead uh, the debrief or the presentation on the earthquake, since he was the incident commander uh, during both days and was, and was responsible for leading the unified command between us and the, uh, the Kern County Fire Department. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Chief Jed McLaughlin. Uh, he's been with uh, the Ridgecrest Police Department for 20 years. Uh, he's going on a second year as uh, as a chief of police, and uh, as you can imagine, uh, he's done a lot of growing, and uh, he's really uh, shined uh, throughout this entire incident. As you most could see, he was on the news quite a bit, and he did a did an excellent job guiding the city through this uh, through this tragic event. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Chief McLaughlin, and that will be available. Uh, for any questions you guys may have uh, after he's done with this presentation. Thank you for having me here. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it was uh, definitely a uh, learning experience, uh, shall we say. But so during the first one, um, obviously the first challenge was the holiday myself I was in shorts and a t-shirt getting ready to barbecue and uh, <clears throat> in the store when uh, the four shock for the six four uh, popped off and <clears throat> the uh, obviously running out the out of the store dragging my wife behind and you know at first you're kind of like eh you know what it was just the ground shaking a little bit, but then uh, as I went to the station, <clears throat> sorry, I got this stupid cold still going, but the uh, when I responded to the station right away, it's obviously chaos. Our dispatch center was overwhelmed, and uh, w the resources that we had working were three officers and a sergeant on and Kern, uh, Kern County Fire had eight firemen working the entire valley. So the resources were tapped. We had broken gas lines uh, <coughs> all over the place, small fires going, and uh, so they were, and dispatch was, it was out of control with the amount of calls coming in. So they were taxed right away. There were, and my concern was, okay, what do we have uh, collapsed on, you know, do we have people trapped? What do we have? There's no way to do a, uh, a windshield survey of the city. So my first call was to uh, Sheriff Youngblood, who was uh, vacationing at his cabin, and he felt the earthquake. He saw my number pop up, and, you know, he's like, well, now I know where the earthquake is. and. Uh, you know, I told him, I said, I need an air unit if you have one. He's, it'll be there in a few minutes. It was at the lake. So luckily they diverted to us. So they were w overhead within, you know, just a short period of time. <coughs> and then I called CHP uh, and asked for an air unit from them as well because they're, uh, after an earthquake, CHP is mandated to check all overpasses and they will often use a helicopter or an airplane to do that, to uh, save time, uh, rather than sending units, thank you, <laughs> rather than sending units, you know, which take time to get to many locations. Uh, 
So we had a, also an airship from uh, CHP overhead relatively not too long after the uh, Kern County Air Unit. So in a short period of time, we had two air, air units flying over the city assessing damage. Um, once we got that report back, then, uh, you know, with no structures on, you know, uh, collapsed other than some reports of uh, the mobile homes in some of the parks on the ground, then it was, you know, getting the gas turned off. Then we had, you're going to hear reports of don't turn the gas off, turn the gas, you know, uh, leave it on, let, let PG&E turn it off. Um, we've talked to PG&E since then, and he's the the main guy from PG&E is like, turn the gas off. You don't, you know, I mean, if you haven't, in fact, uh, one of their things is, you know, zip tie or, or something, some kind of wrench that fits the, ma the, the meter outside should be one of the uh, uh, safety <coughs> things around your home so that you can emergency, uh, in an emergency, shut that gas off. So uh, my, my guys in fire did a great job. They shut those gas lines off. We didn't care at that time. We were shutting them off. <coughs> then as resources started to pour in, uh, we were able to start dispersing them throughout the city. Um, obviously a holiday, we had people on vacation, everybody, all of the resources, you know, throughout Kern County, law enforcement, fire, people were on vacation, 4th of July, uh, we were no different. Uh, one of our officers that had just left, he was getting married, so a lot of my guys were in Mammoth, uh, up there for the wedding. Luckily, they started heading back, and so as the resources started pouring in, they, uh, we started to get back up and, you know, with the county that we have and the relationships that we have here, it was great. Uh, Cal City, uh, Chief Hurtado, he just texted me right after the quake and said, uh, two on their way. So he knew, he knew I didn't, he didn't, we didn't have to talk. He just sent two guys. Um, Chief Martin from BPD, he was the same. Uh, they sent four people and a sergeant right away. So, you know, I knew I had resources coming to help uh, quickly, which was reassuring. So law enforcement-wise, we were good. And fire, they do this stuff all the time. They have this stuff down. They, they, were, they already had their resources coming as well. <coughs> Part of the, uh, once the declaration is made, then, uh, and you request the mutual aid, that's when, you know, and, and Cal OES comes in, if you haven't experienced that, uh, talk about resources, yeah, that's overwhelming and incredible what, what comes in. They have resources and they bring them. And uh, I was just talking about this earlier today can you think of anything that you would have asked for that you would not have been able to get? And my answer is no. If I would have asked for a Sherman tank, I could have got a Sherman tank. Uh, it, whatever you ask for, they're gonna bring it. Um, there were 200 National Guards staged in Palmdale. I believe at one time we had three Black Hawk helicopters sitting in Inyokern in case the, uh, another aftershock came through and they needed it for rescue, either between uh, Ridgecrest or Trona or some other area. So they had resources staged just in case uh, something bigger came through. And at this point, we didn't, you know, the 7 1 we weren't <coughs> expecting. <coughs> so at, at that point, we were able to start focusing on uh, the law enforcement side, is. Uh, The Cal OES chief, the law enforcement chief, uh, we talked and he, he said, look, after these, their experience has been three to 400 mile range, people will come and loot because they want to take advantage of the P 
people that have left their residences or left their businesses. So they will drive from long distances to do this. So we decided to bring in the mutual aid law enforcement and have a large presence in, in our community to uh, prevent that. And so we did. And I made sure that the, uh, when I did a press conference with the media, that I put that out there. And uh, we were going to have that large presence and welcomed anybody to come try out and see if they wanted to test it. So um, we had two cases of, uh, one appears to be a, we're calling it looting, but it looks like this guy was out doing crime spree. Uh, he just happened to hit us at that time. He also hit San Bernardino County and then s and then even further south. Uh, we have him identified and everybody's looking for him now, uh, all those cities as well. <coughs> then on Friday, uh, the 5th, uh, I went to a briefing on the Naval Base where I met uh, Ken Hudnut from the USGS geological survey and uh, Janice Hernandez from uh, Cal uh, CGS and they walked through what the 6-4 uh, quake had done and it's a uh, it was a cross fault quake I've learned more about earthquakes uh, these past couple months than I thought I'd ever would so much so that I thought I would teach the governor when he was in my office and I actually drew it out for him. Um, I'd been up about 40 or 38 hours at this point, so I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> and uh, it was not only the him, but it was about 40 people in that room. And I think back now and I'm like, what was I thinking? But um, I did, I drew it out and explained to him. I gave him a geography lesson that day. So it was a cross fault eruption. And uh, so I sat there and I listened to uh, these two uh, geophysicists talk about the earthquake and I'm in a room with uh, other Navy personnel and uh, rocket scientists, engineers, all these people from the base and expecting to learn a lot of stuff from their questions and I was surprised that when they were done with their presentation there was very few questions other than the standard ones that I would probably ask is, all right, when's the next one? <clears throat> and they gave the standard answer of, well, there's no way to predict that. If you go to the website, you can look and it's these percentages. So the cop and me came out and I started asking the questions. I said, basically what you're telling me is this fault crossed another fault that you didn't know about. And he's like, yeah. I was like, okay, um, have we seen this before? And he's like, yeah, we've seen that before. Okay. How many times? And he's like, oh, you know, a handful of times. I was like, hmm. when was the last time? And that's, he, I don't know if he was getting irritated with me at that point, but I, I saw a little change in him as he started to rattle off. So he started in, and he's very smart. Uh, okay. 1927 and he starts rattling off all of these cross fault quakes and then I really saw the switch click when he got to 1987 and I think it's called the superstition quake and he actually talked about it if you flip the superstition quake over it pretty much mirrors ours and he said uh, when the first eruption happened it was a 6.2 and 11.4 hours later it was a 6.7 and uh, well when he said first I was like hmm clue that means there's a second so uh, long story short I decided I needed to get them into my world so I brought them to my station and I continued with the questioning and uh, I don't want to bore you with all those details, but um, I asked him what the uh, theory on the second uh, fault erupting was, and basically uh, they believe that the liquid faction 
aspect because of the extreme pressure and vibration from the shock liquefies everything at the epicenter and it flows into the second fault and it can only handle so much pressure and then it just gives way. <clears throat> That's the theory. And uh, one of the cool things I thought was, what they said was, when a fault erupts or shocks, um, it travels at 7,000 miles an hour in both directions. So it's very fast and very violent. So we finish up, and this is uh, late in the afternoon. So I call the city manager, and who's back on his way to Mammoth to pick up his stuff so he can get back to us. And uh, now I'd been up for even longer. And I tell him, hey, we're due a 11.4 quake here pretty soon. And he's like, 11.4? It's going to melt the world. <laughs> and uh, no, no, I mean 11.4. It was 11.4 hours later. And uh, while I'm on the phone with him, I said, no, no. And uh, I basically tell him, Ken thinks, you know, he said, because I asked him, how much time are, uh, you know, because we were about 28 to 30 hours later from the 6-4. So I asked him, all right. How much time do we have? And he goes, huh? I don't know. Could be an hour. Could be a day. Could be a week. Could be never. Could be a year. It was one hour later when the 7 1 happened. I was on the phone with uh, Ron, and uh, uh, the mayor and I were standing there talking to him, and uh, when that thing kicked off, and that was a uh, that was a wild ride. And so, what happened to us during that one? Um, our CAD system for dispatch went down. Uh, the one server in the entire IT department that wasn't strapped down obviously uh, tipped over and went out. So there went our dispatch system. So we flipped the switch and transferred everything over to Kern County. Um, didn't miss a beat. Kern County dispatched everything out from there, took the calls, and uh, it was like it went flawlessly. So that worked fine. Um, same thing happened. A lot of gas leaks, uh, fires. We had uh, a residence burned down. Uh, mobile home burned down. Some more mobile homes came off of their foundations and uh, are still on the ground today. Um, some have been put back up. So <coughs> some of the uh, issues that we had right out, right out of the gate, uh, we lost power in the 6-4 to about 9,800 residents. So... Uh, getting updates immediately on when the power was going to come back up. Again, it was a holiday, so getting a hold of PG&E, or uh, Edison, sorry, California Edison, we couldn't get a hold of anybody. And we called the main number, and we were treated like a regular customer, go through the checklist, ask, you know, did are we sure, did we check the switch, go out to the fuse panel and, no, you're not understanding, and, and that's literally what we went through. <clears throat> so a, uh, the chief w was sitting there in our office with, uh, with us from Cal OES, so he's like, oh, let me make a call. So he called, he got the same thing. And uh, the director got called, and uh, we were on the phone with the president from uh, Southern California Edison. We didn't have that problem again. And uh, so it's important to keep those numbers up to date. That is one lesson that we learned. Um, the numbers for all of the utility companies, even your uh, water companies, uh, all of that stuff, you, um, make sure that you have more than just one person, have multiple, because what if that person is out of cell phone range? Um, the other thing 
is make sure that uh, more than one person has keys to the the buildings, especially the buildings you're going to use for your uh, shelter or evacuation centers. Um, make sure that you have multiple people for that or multiple keys. <coughs> Our EOC center, the one here in Kern County, you don't have to worry about it, it's separate anyway. But for our smaller communities, like our, us, Taft, Tatchpee, um, RPD was our EOC. And uh, so that's where everybody uh, staged, was deployed from, everything. A lot of people in and out. So we've already identified what we would do should we have to go through this again. We will use a different location for that. The EOC will be the EOC. Staging area will be somewhere else. Too many people. There, I mean, you, there was hundreds of people all the time in and out. So it becomes uh, way too many people. Um, <coughs> the paperwork documentation is uh, very important. Uh, Fire's really good at this because they do it all the time. Take heed from the fire department. Have somebody on the uh, the emergency paperwork, the one that Cal OES is going to need and FEMA is going to need immediately. They should be in place first thing. Checking people in, handing them the paperwork, collecting it when those people leave <coughs> so that you don't have to try to chase them back down. Um, <coughs> some of the uh, information that uh, what I feel we did right and that uh, lesson that we learned rather quickly was putting information out um, press releases the old fashioned way um, don't work anymore uh, writing it posting it and we did, you know, just like most of us do all the time, you, you know, you type something out, you post it out there, give it to the paper, give it to the media. Yeah, the, so everybody was saying, well, you know, what about information? And it wasn't working. So we were looking at our hits on what we were getting on those, and it was very small. So I decided, you know what, let's do a, a quick video and so we did a quick video and, and almost within a few minutes, it had over, it was, well, it was 38,000 in a few minutes, 38,000 hits. So we started doing videos, still did our post, but then we would do a video also, and we still used radio, paper, our message board, and then we had the board set up everywhere else. So we still did everything else, but we also did a video, and that was the biggest key. So. Unfortunately, we're going to have to get out of that comfort zone and, and stand in front of that thing <coughs> um, and be visible within the community. That was key. Having the officers out there all the time patrolling the neighborhoods was, uh, was huge for us. Um, just talking to the community, that was uh, really put them at ease. You know, we had a lot of people sleeping outside because they didn't want to go back into their houses and sleep, so uh, that was big. Uh, another thing that we do, and have been for, I don't know how many years, a long time, uh, we hold monthly EOC meetings with all of our stakeholders, uh, school district, emergency services people, every uh, first Thursday of the month, we get together and, and talk about uh, emergency operations from you know, different scenarios, floods, tornadoes, you know, all kinds of different things. Red Cross is there and then, you know, all that. So if you don't currently do that, I would recommend that you do because then that not only helps during something like this, but it, everybody gets to know each other as well and learn what resources you have in place already. And it made it fluid when we activated the EOCs with you know, ours then with current counties, it it, uh, it just went uh, smooth. <coughs> then the uh, 
town hall meeting. Uh, we did that quickly. Uh, we held that on Sunday, and we thought, eh, 10, 12 people show up. About six or 700 showed up. Uh, it was packed, and it went uh, very well. They, it was, uh, you know, putting out information. We had a lot of stakeholders there. Um, politicians, senators, the assemblyman was there, and so they were able to get their information out to those people, and, and it was all about providing information. So the more information, the happier the, the, the citizens are. Um, <clears throat> a training, training is uh, a big deal. Uh, it's huge. I talked about this last week at the uh, the Governor's Safety Seismic Commission Incident Command System. I know that uh, I know most of your police departments in here, where we have a lot of young new people. They don't have any of that knowledge yet. Uh, we need to get them through that stuff. Having a trained uh, PIO is important. I got lucky and I had uh, Andrew from the fire department. He was uh, a great a great help to me and our community. And the post one, the post uh, PIO course is not good enough. It's only two days. The FEMA, FEMA puts on a great course for that. It's a couple weeks long, but they teach how to, uh, the message, how to put the message out there, how to calm, calm your citizens and, and what kind of message to put out. So that's good. <clears throat> um, one of the ones that I learned the hard way was uh, uh, the forgotten is our families. So first responder families, uh, especially our small communities, uh, they're sitting at home. And uh, the significant others told me that uh, I could have put them to work. So utilize them. They don't want to sit idle. And it puts them t at ease. And it would probably also put you know, the other first responders at ease. They want to help. So. <coughs> That was a uh, um, huge, so I, I got kind of chastised for that. So, and uh, mental health, uh, I brought them in probably a couple days too late. Should have brought them in right away. Uh, they were right across the parking lot. I could have easily had them just in my building as well. So I did bring them in, but don't forget about. Uh, uh, I also brought them in for the uh, significant others as well. And so don't forget about uh, everybody else involved. And hotels. Oh, yes. Don't forget the hotels. So this happened. Um, the hotel staff, uh, they all left. So... Uh, the managers of the hotels were calling each other, hey, uh, I don't have any staff to get these rooms ready. Uh, can we borrow your people? Yeah, that'd be nice, but all mine left too. So they had one or two people trying to get the entire hotel ready so that they could rent to not all the first responders coming in, Cal OES, everybody that was coming in the city to help. They had no staff to get these places ready. And... Uh, yeah, that was a huge problem and something we'd never thought of or encountered. And um, so, but one of the uh, things when I would talk to the hotel managers, none of them have generators. Uh, so when the power goes out, they have to kick everybody out. And the other thing that they're not mandated to have here in California is an emergency intercom system to be able to uh, communicate with the rooms. So during an emergency, they have no way to communicate with the entire hotel. 
in uh, Washington State, where one of them was from, they said that they can communicate with the, it's mandated up there. Uh, I, I found that kind of shocking that they didn't have that, but uh, yeah, no, no communication with uh, the entire hotel, so. And uh, then the aftermath, um, taking care of the citizens that are displaced and or with damaged properties. That is a, we've done a, about a thousand inspections. Um, some just called because they wanted to make sure their house was still livable. Um, some truly were red tagged or yellow tagged. And I know many of you guys sent inspectors from your own cities to help us and but it's the documentation of those. So uh, with the help with Georgiana, uh, her and I have been talking about, uh, about this is once you go, we go out there and we talk to these folks, then if they're red tagged or yellow tagged, that may say they're red tagged, we red tag their house, then you go to try to find these people afterwards, they're gone. You might have had a cell phone. What if it's a prepaid phone? We're having a hard time finding some of them now. So uh, with her help, we're creating a form right now with fire, with Kern County Fire. Um, <clears throat> so in an emergency, they'll be able to bring this form up, give it to, say, Tehachapi, Taft, or whatever city. You'll be able to put it on your website, give it to uh, uh, whoever you want, They'll be able to fill it out. It'll go in the, in the database so that it'll be one form for all of the county to utilize so that when in the recovery process, we'll have the information that is required for uh, recovery assistance to when we need to find these people to help, you know, to get them help. And it will have the information for FEMA, CDAA and uh, all of that stuff because you know we need the numbers for uh, that if if you qualify for the individual assistance. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions if you have it. Thank you very much. Uh, you. Appreciate your work. Can I say something well, first? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's great and really appreciate the efforts of the whole community and thank you again and Mr. Smith has a comment. Uh, our city manager Greg Garrett mentioned that uh, and we just passed a resolution to have in place in each city a list of designated people who are authorized to in the process of declaring an emergency yeah. or requesting sure. emergency services. So yes. we we've designated like the mayor, city manager, treasurer or a finance person but you should have four or five people because if they're out of town they've got you have to have an official request is that correct correct and then that that will be good for three years so every three years all you have to do is update it and re uh, uh, just repass it and that way you, you keep it on file then you don't have to hold a special meeting uh, to get that passed so it's a good idea to do that and like we had to hold a special meeting to do it so now we just have to update ours every three years and if you do it and just send send the letter with the names that way because names change um, in the resolution just put you know city manager finance director and stuff like that and then all you have to do is send the letter to update names <coughs> yes sir i have a question um how long did it take to get your filling station back in line again after that earthquake? Yeah. Your uh, gas stations, usually when we have an earthquake, they close them down for inspection. How long did it take to get them up and running again? Actually, uh, power-wise was the only time they went down, but we do have a couple gas stations that uh, have generators, so we never lost gas service, um, at least to those two. So, yeah, uh, the gas stations never never uh, went down you have to inspect the tanks or anything underground no no they wow. didn't I, I, didn't I was see in that 7.2 anyway. down in Pro Valley on <coughs> Easter Sunday 
they were down for almost a week or so if they got them running again. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I had to go out of town or get fuel. Yeah, no, ours didn't. No. That's no. good. Yeah. Thank you. The, uh, the other thing that we didn't lose was water either. The only leak we had was past customer service. Trona lost water, though, for quite a few days. Any other questions, comments? Thank you again. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Okay, we'll start our official 630 Current Council of Governments Transportation Planning and Policy Committee. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Roll call, please. Garola. Present. B. Smith. I'm here. Vicinovich. Present. Vallejo. Here. Crump. Here. Cantu. Present. Mauer. Here. Alvarado. Here. Cryer. Here. P. Smith. Here. Reina. Here. Couch. Here. Scrivener. Here. Miller. Dermody? Here. And Para. <laughs> Weisenried? Here. Did I say it right? Winsenried? Yeah. Here. Thank you. And Bello. Okay. Uh, Kiernan. Last one. Thank you. Okay, public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes. The authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public statements? Seeing none, consent agenda opportunity for public comment. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kern- Kerncog staff and will be approved by one motion No member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before action is taken. Staff has requested that item M be pulled. Does anybody wish any other items be pulled from the consent agenda? Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, I have a minor correction to item I uh, in the description is in your folders. The resolu- the um, action remains the same. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Troy Hightower, I'm independent consultant, and I have some questions and concern about consent item number N, SB 375 update. Thank you. So item M and N will be pulled from the consent agenda. Any members wish to pull anything else? Can I have a motion? Items A through P, accepting M and N. Move to approve. Okay. Roll call ready? Garola? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Lucinovich? Aye. Vallejo? Aye. Grump? Aye. Cantu? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Alvarado? Aye. Cryer? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Reina? 
Yes. Couch? Yes. Scrivener? Aye. Miller? Yes. Thank you. Item M, Kern Cog Fiscal Year 2019-20 State of Good Repair Transit Program of Projects for million three oh one six six one, Mr. Snuddy. Thank you, Chair. Members of the committee, I want to point your uh, attention to attachment A that we put in your uh, list tonight. The purpose of this was we are now moving into the future on the Caltrans State of Good Repair program. They've gone from a paper transaction to an electronic program. So all of the uh, member agencies were required to submit an electronic grant application to me first. I reviewed the grants and forwarded them electronically onto Caltrans, and they were automatically approved. At the last minute, late Friday afternoon, I got a response back from Caltrans after all of the grants had been approved and so showed on my screen. They had changes that they wanted made in several of the uh, grant applications, specifically the ones that are highlighted in bolded in the agency's name. Most of them were just, we want a little bit more information so that we can have more transparency in the transaction. But on Delano, they decided that they wanted another project altogether. Yeah. So I caught Viviana up there in Delano at her dentist appointment, and she was kind enough to go home and change the appointment and get it through. So everything has been uh, cleared through uh, Caltrans. Everybody has responded, and we're good to go. We just have a slight variation on the project description. The amount of money remains constant and that's in your folders Last page. the action remains the same is to adopt the program of projects any questions can I have a motion on item M move to approve is this roll call or mm -hmm. voice one Like money, like Sorry. Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Sinovich? Aye. Vallejo? Yes. Crump? Aye. Cantu? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Alvarado? Yes. Pryor? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Reyna? Yes. Couch? Yes. Scrivener? Aye. And Miller? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Item N, update SB 375, greenhouse gas emission reduction from passenger vehicles and adoption timeline for the 2022 RTP. Mr. Ball. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is an information item, and uh, so we'd be happy to answer any questions related to it. Mr. Hightower. Good evening again, Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Troy Hightower. I have a few questions mainly for clarity and to try and get an understanding. I understand that we're beginning the process to develop the next RTP SCS. So under the discussion section of the staff report, there's mention of a meeting about a plan over plan analysis for the three larger uh, Valley MPOs. And I'm just not sure what that is, so if maybe staff could explain what that was or is briefly and, and its purpose uh, yeah we'd be happy to the uh, plan over plan analysis would compare a current plan the plan or in this case the 2022 plan with a prior year plan and would look at the uh, strategies and uh, the amount of spending and all of that within that uh, plan uh, and compare it to the way it was in one of in that prior plan. We, we've done that uh, in the in the past. There there are some uh, MPOs that have not done that in the past, and they're they're um, uh, they have some concerns about that process. And and uh, uh, so the smaller MPOs are not doing it, but the larger ones are. Oh, yeah, that, that, is, that is correct, that in the draft guidelines that are now out for public review, uh, they are requesting that all eight Valley Cogs, the smaller ones as well as the three lar larger ones, uh, uh, do that particular, um, uh, that particular analysis. 
Uh, thank you. That clears things up, and it, it leads to my next question, which is um, refers to Table 1 in the staff report. And the table lists the, the targets and what was projected in the RTPs for 2011, and then the next line goes to the 2018 RTP with the target amounts and then the, the new target. But there, it, the 2014 RTP SCS numbers are not on here. And so I'd like to know what the 2014 RTP numbers were. And, and that I, I think is related to what you were talking about with the plan over plan. So we can look at what previous plans were done. I, I don't know if you have those um, target numbers available or. And then the actual 2014 RTP numbers were. So, so yes, th they're in that prior document. We can look it up. I don't have that information. Okay, right here I'd appreciate me. that. And I think it, it would this table would make more sense if you had all of the RTP numbers in there, especially as you mentioned when we're looking at comparing plan versus plan. And then finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, th there's a lot of meetings listed in this staff report, and I'm not sure what the purpose of those meetings were. Um, I don't know if it was whether to review RTPs or discussions about the new target of 15. And so if staff could clarify what the purpose was of, of all these meetings that have gone in as, as recent as um, this month. Uh, uh, certainly. Uh, this uh, staff report is primarily for the Regional Planning Advisory Committee, which is was well, the committee set up by your board to oversee the SB 375 process. And so what this report is doing is uh, reporting to that subcommittee the interactions that we're having with the Air Resources Board, which is the uh, agency that's responsible for implementing SB 375. Uh, thank you, and I would like to maybe get by email those those actual numbers. Thank you, Mrs. Chairman. Thank you. Any questions? Any more questions from the public? Any from members? Okay, that's information item only, so we will move to item 5, 2019 Federal Transportation Improvement Program Draft Amendment Number 6, Ms. Pacheco. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Amendment number six includes revisions to the State Highway Regional Choice Program. The public review period ends today at the close of the public hearing. The Kern Cog Executive Director will consider approval of the amendment on September 20th. State and federal approval is required. At this time, I ask the Chair to please open the public hearing, allow for public comment, and then close the public hearing. Thank you. Public hearing is open. Does any public wish to speak on this item? <coughs> Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Item 6, 2019 Federal Transportation Improvement Program. Draft Amendment Number 7, Ms. Pacheco. Amendment Number 7 includes revisions to the State Highway Operations and Protection Program and the Regional Surface Transportation Program. The public review period ends today at the close of the public hearing. The Kern Cog Executive Director will consider approval of the amendment on September 20th. State and federal approval is required. At this time, I ask the Chair to please open the public hearing, allow for public comment, and then close the public hearing. Public hearing is open. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Any board members meeting report? Any comments from board members? Mr. Chair, before we move forward on items that were pulled M and N, uh, we voted it um, M and then we are not going to vote on it, it was information item only. Even though it was on the consent. Mm -hmm. It was on the consent. There's there's no vote needed for an information. Sorry. There's no vote needed for an information item. 
Okay, that's that's even when they're included in the consent. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Caltrans report. Okay. All right. Um, we'll start off with Formosa 4699 bridge replacement. Uh, that project was completed on August 27th. And moving on to State Route 46, um, that's the widening of 46 from two to four lanes from Lost Hills Road to I-5. Current activities continue construction at Main Flood Canal Bridge. Also construction West Side Canal drainage systems and roadway excavation. There will be lane closures um, on I-5. Actually, it says it may be lane closures on I-5 due to the bridge construction. Traffic delays are expected on the weekends. Uh, this project is scheduled to be completed uh, June of 2020. And then we have a rehab project on 99 um, and that is 0.3 miles south of Palm Avenue overcrossing to Beardsley Canal Bridge and then we have also rehab on State Route 178 and that is at the 99 and 178 separation. Uh, work mainly on the north side of 99. The traffic shifted to the inside lanes the number one and number two lanes, and one lane split in southbound direction with K-Rail. Contractor placed K-Rail and started work on replacing the outside lanes, numbers three and four, and outside shoulder starting at Palm Avenue overcrossing going northward. Contractor also closed the northbound Rose, Rosedale um, and 24th Street off-ramp for a 55-day closure. That started September 3rd. This will allow construction of the auxiliary lane and the addition of a third lane for the off-ramp. At the Buck Owens um, Rosedale Highway intersection, they are constructing a retaining wall. And then moving on to Cache Creek Bridge replacement on State Route 58. That is um, eight miles east of Tehachapi from the Sand Canyon overhead to half mile east of Cache Age Creek. Eastbound bridge demolition was performed um, between July 29th and August 2nd, and then on August 5th, the contractor began installing initial piles for bridge foundation. Initial piles were completed on August 28th, and installation for the remaining piles will begin or did begin on September 3rd on the west bank of the eastbound State Route 58. Uh, work for next month is going to be continued uh, pile installation. And then we have the summit overhead bridge rails on State Route 50, also near uh, to Hatchby at the summit overhead. Bridge work began in July. False work was in, I mean in June. False work was installed in July. Or, yes, July. Demolition started on July 17th. As of September 11th, right sides of bridge deck on both directions have been poured. Work for next month. Remove false work and switch to the left side of the bridge in both directions and begin demolition of the existing bridge railing. Lairdo Canal medium gap closure. So that's medium deck closure near Bakersfield out. Lairdo Canal on State Route 99. Work currently scheduled for the next 30 days. Um, traffic was well, be, traffic was switched onto outside shoulders, both northbound and southbound. Medium work behind K rails has begun. Bridge piles and abutments have been completed. Precast bridge girders should be set at uh, first week in October. The cr what they're doing with traffic control is nightly closures on anticipated northbound and southbound during October. It'll be Sunday through Thursday night, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Both outside and inside shoulders will remain closed until February 15th of next year. The Bell Terrace overcrossing, that's to construction, uh, construct an auxiliary lane and replace Bell Terrace Bridge on 99. 
the approach slabs and concrete barriers on the new northbound 99 to eastbound 58 connector bridge uh, was constructed last month and the bridge is complete. Concrete paving for the ramps on either side of the bridge will be completed in the coming weeks. Installation of new lighting system and metal beam guardrail should begin later in the month. The new connector bridge is expected to open in October. Construction of the retaining wall along the outside shoulder of northbound 99 continues. The wall will allow northbound 99 to be, the, to be widened between 58 and Ming Avenue. The installation of shoring adjacent to Ming Avenue on-ramp was completed last month, allowing for the construction of a cast-in-place concrete retaining wall at that location. At, uh, on the California Aqueduct bridge overlay on 99 and I-5, um, work is complete except for minor punch list items which are being addressed this week. Bridge separation and pavement rehab on 99 and I-5 junction to Panama Lane overcrossing. Uh, work currently scheduled is lowering of lanes and shoulders to provide for the vertical clearance improvements on southbound 99 at Route 5 overcrossing. Other work includes excavation, hot mix asphalt, continuous reinforced concrete pavement, and then on north the northbound lane from um, they're doing um, they placed the K rail work is uh, re work on replacing lane number three and shoulders have started contractor removing excavating existing lane and shoulder and started uh, doing the continuous reinforced concrete pavement on number three lane and the shoulder Stockdale Enos roundabout this is a roundabout at 43 and Stockdale highway the project replaces an existing four-way stop with a roundabout. The contractor finished paving the shoe fly, whatever that is, which provides access to and from, I know I've been told that, but I don't remember, uh, provides access to and from State Route 43 south of Stockton Highway, and the, they've shifted traffic onto the new pavement. On 43, uh, access is closed on the north side of Stockton Highway through the end of the year, Motors can use Heath Road to travel between Rosedale Highway and Stockdale Highway during this closure. Crews are currently working on drainage and roadway grading behind the temporary concrete barrier rail. Drainage with the exception of new of drainage with the exception of a new basin is expected to be completed in September, so that's this month. Crews will begin placing aggregate base and will work on installation of curb gutter and splitter islands in the coming weeks. Last page. So here's the other roundabout, and this is at 119 and 43. As of last month, the contractor switched traffic onto the new roadway section of State Route 119, that's the north, north half, and closure of the existing roadway section on the southern half. There were no traffic issues associated with the switch the intersection remains a three-way stop with 43 still closed to through traffic. Roadway work on the southern half of 119 portion of Venus Lane is in progress. Contractor completed one-fourth of the JPCP circle last week as well as earthwork for roadway embankment. Curb gutter was poured last week and, and will continue into this week. Hot mix asphalt paving for this phase anticipated to be completed by the end of the month. They actually gave me a date of September 27th. The existing business, which is the shell station that the southeast quadrant is open with driveway entrances on Enos, Avenue, Enos Lane remain, that remains open. The entrance on 119 is closed to construction, however. Also, the contractor is flagging traffic through the three-way stop to relieve daily traffic backups occurring during the late afternoon commuting hours. This phase is anticipated to last through the beginning of October. Gap closure. Uh, this is a rehab project on State Route 58 and 99 separation to Cottonwood Road. Uh, eastbound, uh, they plan to switch traffic to the left lanes. Two left lanes, or two left lanes will remain open. Right lane will be closed for construction. 
This work is scheduled next week, starting on Sunday night. On the westbound, contractor will continue wide flange beam construction. Traffic will stay split for the next three weeks. Const um, this is a construction of rank, a rock blanket at the Gora areas uh, and maintenance pullout, vehicle pullouts. The rock blanket installation work continues. Contractors currently working in the area of Beale Avenue and 178 and continuing east to, to other locations along 178. Shoulder and ramp closures are being implemented nightly, Sunday through Thursday at uh, these locations. Project completion is scheduled for November. And then the last one um, is Cottonwood East Rehab on State Route 58 in Bakersfield from Cottonwood Road under crossing to just east of the 158 and 184 separation. This project is in, in its final stage and is approximately 98% complete. Contractor is working on the shoulders. They are scheduled to complete the project uh, the first of the year. And that completes my report. And unless there's any questions, don't ask me what a shoe fly is. Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, have comments, right, Gail? Yes. yes. Oh, I couldn't figure out where they're coming from. Okay. Yes, uh, Highway 46. I drive that every morning to Las Hills. Is it possible to ask Caltrans to provide eastbound traffic that will be eventually merging on to southbound I-5 if they would consider announcing either on the radio um, or maybe some signage providing an alterna alternate route at Lost Hills Road? Because oh. if they would turn right on Lost Hills Road, they'd, they could then pick up... Um, uh, not seven standard, but um, yeah, I don't know. So what's the next one? Is over? it seven standard? Lairdo. Lairdo. They can pick up Lairdo, yes, and then go left, and then pick up uh, I five there, because what happens is the residents in Lost Hills in the evening, the only place they can go to get gas, is back at that I five intersection. So, what's sad is that you know there's a, a line that is at least 30, 45 minutes long, and these people are are getting on the side. Uh, ag or you know, yeah. field roads and it's creating all this dust and so people are going back and forth on both ends of highway 46 trying to get there because they want to get home after work after they get gas um, groceries are okay because they do have grocery stores there somewhat unless you have to get to wasco but for the residents there it's creating a a very um, um, difficult situation for them to go get gas either in the evenings or early in the morning um, and uh, it's mostly after three, two, three o'clock in the afternoon that, that that's happening. But if the trucks are coming in and they don't need to stop for gas at the intersection, they can take that uh, Lost Hills to Laredo and then hit I-5. So I would appreciate it if you can share that with them. That yep. uh, that would that would really help the community out tremendously. I'll and talk definitely to pr pr provide a safer, you know, congestion. You know, the congestion there would be uh, it would help in the area of safety to keep people from getting off the main sure. road and onto these farm roads. And I'll talk to, uh, tomorrow I'll talk to the project manager and also talk to the resident engineer and see Perfect. what we can do about maybe doing an alternative route. Yes, please. That might help that. I, I can't promise it. anything. I don't I know how that works, but you know I'll try. Yeah, I, and I would definitely appreciate that. I think it would, it's a safety issue. And I'll issue. follow up with you too on, on the outcome of that. Thank you, great, thank you. Yes. Thank you, any other comments, questions? Mr. Yes. Chairman, um, I just wanted to bring up something that I had spoken about before, and that was uh, the new um, traffic pattern, and specifically the ramp that uh, from uh, Highway 46 on to uh, southbound 99. Uh, one of my concerns was that uh, there is a probability that a vehicle might take the turn too fast and actually go over uh, the edge of the ramp there. And guess what? Somebody already hit that short railing that they had put there. So the probability still exists that somebody is going to take that too fast and go over the edge. So if you could look into yeah. that, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, because uh, if you go by now, I couldn't stop to take a picture, but there's a big indentation on that, on that railing, which proves you know, that the probability is really there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Any other comments? And, and District 9? Okay. Um, a real quick update on ours. Um, 
we had two projects on uh, Route 58. Uh, the first one was uh, just west of Tehachapi. We finished a sl uh, replacement, replacing slabs up there. That was completed at the end of um, July. Uh, the second project is ongoing um, just west of Boron, and that is uh, also a, um, repl a slab replacement, mill and fill out there. Um, that's currently in construction. Uh, the uh, last project I have is we completed on uh, Kern 178 uh, to the west of uh, Highway 14 up near um, Kern Valley uh, and also on 395 uh, just west of Inyo Kern a um, uh, highway maintenance project uh, placing down um, asphalt that was completed at the in August and that's it thank you any comments questions mr. Smith yes uh, and wanted to thank uh, district 9 for uh, having us up the attached contingent went up and visited district 9's uh, folks up there yesterday and uh, had some really really I thought uh, constructive uh, discussions on some of the projects that are in the queue but are a ways down the way uh, a ways out uh, specifically the truck climbing lanes you know it's one of the items on this list here you've heard me talk about that for 20 years if you've been here but uh, but at the same time the uh, the pro there is progress on the planning part of it that shows on here it's fit that I was happy to hear that it wasn't just a project that it's a uh, a theory or or whatever you would call it it's actually there's actual work by engineering planners uh, on that project and that was a, a main thing and then uh, with the Freeman Gulch projects and the other uh, projects on 395 how we can somehow work together funding these things because they they've been in the works for a long time all of them and uh, I'm hopeful we can have some cooperation and, and get everyone's projects done but uh, I was very it was a good meeting. I say thank you to everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, executive director's report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman uh, and board members. Uh, since we haven't met since July, I have a few more uh, items than usual. Uh, the CTC met in San Jose on August 14th and 15th. I, I was there and will be at their next meeting in Modesto. Actually, uh, Mr. Stromali will be at the meeting on the October 9th. The CTC on the 10th of October will be having a joint meeting with Air Resources Board, which I will attend and be uh, part of the program. Uh, on July 23rd, the Kern County Board of Supervisors uh, held the first resolution of necessity hearing for the Route 46 project. As a reminder, Kern County is assisting Caltrans with all the right-of-way acquisition on that project. Thank you to the Board of Supervisors and the county staff for taking that on and our council is involved with with those actions also. There'll be uh, several more batches of resolutions of necessities coming in the next couple of months. Um, we held a meeting um, with uh, City of Bakersfield with our, our bicycle consultant who we have on board for a uh, grant we received on July 24th and he is actively assisting um, City of Bakersfield uh, to try to get their uh, bike share program off, off the ground. We hope to have that um, that project on the CTC agenda for October is what we're shooting for. On August 7th I met with uh, Supervisor Scribner, the Taft City Manager and the Mayor to talk about issues uh, on 119 that led to a follow-up uh, meeting here. Both meetings were uh, productive and uh, Caltrans uh, was available for the second meeting. Thank you, Gail, for sending um, both your uh, planning people, maintenance people, and traffic people to those meetings. Uh, on August, August 19th, I met with um, by phone with Caltrans, Kings County, Caltrans headquarters, and others, including Gail, to finalize, well, not, not quite finalize, to, to come to an agreement over the use of 
an additional $200,000 uh, from Kings County that they will be giving Kern County to spend on a uh, zero emissions uh, freight study on I-5. And you'll hear more about that in the next uh, few months. The, the current plan is to use uh, UC Davis to do some of that work for us. And I'm still looking, Gail and uh, Supervisor Couch and others, for about uh, $7,000 from three different agencies to help us with the match. Uh, on August 20th, High Speed Rail CEO was in Bakersfield. Um, I met with him along with uh, several other uh, leaders in transportation. Um, his boss, or actually he's not his boss, he works for a board, but the uh, new Secretary of Transportation for California will be in town October 1st. Uh, Chairman Smith and S Supervisor Couch, the Vice Chairman, and I will meet. With, will be meeting with him on October 1st. Uh, August 22nd, Mr. Ball attended a kickoff meeting for the state, state Route 99 corridor management plan that is being led by Caltrans Planning. Ms. Ms. Miller, thank you, Gail. We will continue to um, support your efforts for master planning State Route 99. Um, September 16th and 18th, that's Monday and Wednesday, um, I believe uh, Council Member Smith mentioned. But on the 16th, I went over to Ridgecrest and met with Inyo, Mono, and District 9 staff to discuss uh, mostly Eastern current issues, specifically truck climbing lanes, uh, improve and also uh, improvements on for Freeman Gulch and the long-term viability of those projects and our ability in the future to, af frankly, afford those projects. Uh, we followed up the meeting Monday with a trip up to Bishop where I attended with uh, Supervisor Smith and the city manager and planning director for the city of, city of Tehachapi. We uh, look forward to working with District 9 in the future, but uh, Th this board uh, ha has made it clear before and will we'll likely again that uh, the truck climbing la lanes on 58 are a higher priority um, than the uh, widening of 14 on Freeman Gulch. Um, sounds like super, looks like Supervisor Scribner wants to add a comment. Well, I'm happy to wait until you're finished though, Mr. Hakimi. Just one, one more item. Uh, this Friday there is um, probably about the third meeting um, regarding um, pedestrian overcrossing in Lost Hills. We had a meeting less than a month ago where we tweaked the location to several hundred feet east of the intersection of Lost Hills Road and 46. Wonderful company. Um, for those of you that don't know, private company is paying for a pedestrian overcrossing in Lost Hills. Uh, Mayor Cantu, in his regular job with Wonderful, has been attending those meetings. Next meeting is this this Friday, Mayor Cantu. Yeah, this, yes. At what time? I got you. I'll get with you right okay, after the yeah, meeting. Uh, that Sorry. concludes my report, uh, Mr. Chairman, subject to any questions. Mr. But Chairman. Thank you. Supervisor Scrivener. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Akimi, I'd like to ask you what you think is the best way in which we as a body can um, can codify in some way um, our support for making those climbing lanes on the 58 a, a priority for District 9. Um, the, the traffic continues to get more and more congested. Uh, the truck traffic particularly continues to increase and um, as we see Kern becoming more of a logistics hub and um, what, what we already know which is uh, a tremendous amount of that traffic is not traffic that's generated locally, but it's traffic that's generated throughout the state, throughout the country, and it's going through that area. Um, if you are, if you are um, westbound, the, the traffic is not an issue um, because the trucks are going downhill and traffic flows smoothly. But if you are going east and you are climbing those hills, those trucks are pulling out into the fast lane and they are, one of them's going 29 miles an hour, the other one's going 30. 
<laughs> and they, if you're lucky. If you're lucky, yeah. And they, totally. and so everybody else is behind them. And I tell you, the biggest issue are the are the chances that people are taking because of their frustration with that truck traffic. That I have seen people do things that are frankly crazy. Um, not just dangerous, but really, really taking their lives and everyone else's lives in their own hands um, with the moves that they'll make. I've seen people pass on both shoulders. And so I think that this body really needs to um, make it clear that that is our priority for, for that uh, region, uh, for that district rather. And um, I don't know if that's a resolution or if we can agendize a discussion, but I think it's important because it is going to get more and more congested as the days go by. So I, I look to you to give us some suggestions on how we might do that. And I, I would hope that the rest of the board um, of Kern Cog would like to do that as well. Uh, th through the Chairman Supervisor Scrivener, I, I plan on uh, bringing this board um, an update on our MOU. We, we've had an MOU with Inyo, Mono, and uh, and Caltrans since 1999 or 1998, I believe, about 20 years. Uh, that MOU does not include truck climbing lanes. Um, I'll, I'll bring it back next month, and we can certainly have a discussion about potentially adding in to the next MOU the truck climbing lanes, or uh, if the board prefers, I'll come up with some options that um, we uh, send an, a letter to Caltrans. But I will uh, remind everyone that uh, one of the projects that was uh, that you um, were made aware of on the consent agenda is a project that was submitted by the city of Tehachapi on behalf of Caltrans District <coughs> 9, a CMAC project um, for to advance the um, advance the truck climbing right. lanes on Route 58. The, uh, the list of CMAC funded projects will come back to you in, uh, in several months. So I'm actively working with um, Caltrans District 9 to keep them working on that project. A and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that w this board will decide to um, give District 9 the option to use CMAC money from this board to keep them working. Uh, but uh, I will come up some with some options to uh, officially let them know other than the conversations I've been having with them. Uh, sounds like uh, Brian wants to say something too. We are aware of the project and it is a priority project to us too. So we, we are- Top priority? Huh? Top yeah, priority? Yeah, top priority. Thank we are you. actively working on it and that's why we've worked with Aaron to uh, try and keep this project moving. We're Thank in you. the planning, in the er advanced planning stages right now. We should be finishing up a document in January and the next step is to move into the environmental phase so we can start looking at alternatives. So we're actively working on it. It's a priority, top priority to us. And uh, we have we completely agree with that project. Thank you forward. so much. Appreciate so. it. Thank uh, you. Yeah. And, and that's from district. No <laughs> we're, we're supporting we're, it. So. Well, one other thing we can do is we had an update mm, s about six months ago, I would say, maybe longer. I could be wrong from from district nine on that project how about an update when the psr is finished either in january or february we definitely do that no problem so. okay mr chair uh and this may be a, a silly suggestion but i'm sure that's not going to happen overnight um are we not allowed to put maybe no truck passing uh be in those distances where they're they're passing and and they are holding up the lane because there, you know, throughout the state, I'm sure there are roads where those trucks are not allowed to pass each other. I, I can answer that, uh, Council Member. So on, on a, a two on a free a freeway that only has two lanes, you cannot restrict uh, trucks from passing. If there was a third lane available or a or a truck climbing lane, you can restrict the trucks from going into the the number one or fast lane. Like if you drive over the grapevine, which I know you have, trucks are not allowed in the number one. Number one is the leftmost, and the number two is the lane next to that. They are not allowed, and they can be ticketed for being in those lanes. But you you can't do that when there's only two lanes, because when you have a, a loaded truck and an unloaded truck, y you have to give the un <laughs> unloaded truck an opportunity to pass, or else literally it, they would queue up for miles and miles and miles. 
Thank you. Any other member statements? Yes, uh, through the chair. Um, yes, Mr. Mr. Akimi, uh, I was looking through this um, I guess program or this, this uh, presentation. Is this something that's already transpired? Is this a presentation that was offered somewhere? Uh, this is on the Opportunity Zone Outlook and Marketplace? That, that's something, uh, uh, Mayor Cantu, that uh, Chairman Smith asked me to look into. Um, and it's f for Im information now. I thought about possibly bringing someone in um, to do a workshop, but it, it has not worked out to do okay. a workshop. Right. So it's just information now. Great, great. Just because currently, um, you may be aware of this, both McFarland, Delano, and Bakersfield have opportunity zones, and the more information we can get, any changes or updates, we'd definitely like, like to take that back to staff. Arvin as well? Okay. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned, and oh. we will open. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. I, ju I just want to thank Sorry. our director, uh, Aaron Hakimi, and our staff, Becky Napier. They did a great job of the coordinating for our COG uh, in the Valley COG visit to D.C. It, it was a great visit. I encourage any of you next year to attend uh, because, uh, you know, some of those meetings were very beneficial. And, again, staff did a great job with everything that uh, I was involved in, I know. Thank you. I, I was going to cover that on, on the next agenda, but I'll, I'll cover it now, uh, uh, Council Member Vallejo. Uh, she, uh, Council Member is being modest. She was the star of the show. She, uh, she represented this board um, exceptionally well. Um, the uh, uh, Council Member Vallejo's topic was the solvency of the Highway Trust Fund, which I which is a national issue that has been on the table for over a decade. In fact, Supervisor Scribner served on a national panel um, that addressed this issue about a decade ago, um, and and uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, got nothing but positive comments from. Um, the elected officials we met with, in including the Vice President of the United States, about uh, Council Member Vallejo's performance. It was outstanding. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, we will open the uh, current Council of Governments meeting. Roll call is the same, I believe. Public comment rules are the same. Are there any public comments? Seeing none, consent agenda opportunity for public comment. Any public comments on the consent agenda? Seeing none, I would look for a motion on the consent agenda. M move to approve consent agenda items. Second. Roll call. Garola? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Lasinovich? Aye. Vallejo? Crum? Aye. Cantu? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Alvarado? Aye. Cryer? Aye. Yes. <laughs> P. Smith? Yes. Reyna? Yes. Couch? Yes. Scrivener? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Status of San Joaquin Valley Regional Policy Council, Ms. Napier. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. The governor signed AB 101 into law on July 31st, 2019. Staff of the Eight Valley COGS recommended that the San Joaquin Valley Regional Policy Council with the current staff member, Michael Sagala, be the entity for the San Joaquin Valley Multi-Agency Working Group required under AB 101. The San Joaquin Valley Multi-Agency Working Group will be the conduit for one-time funding, including grants for planning activities to enable jurisdictions to meet the sixth cycle of the Regional Housing Need Assessment. AB 101 requires that each county in the San Joaquin Valley name to the San Joaquin Valley Multi-Agency Working Group one representative from each county, two city representatives, one from a larger city and one from a smaller city to be selected by the city selection committee. And of the three representatives, at least one representative shall also be a member of the COG board. On September 10th, the Kern County Board of Supervisors appointed Supervisor Scrivener to the San Joaquin Valley Multi-Agency Working Group. Congratulations. The city selection committee met prior to the Kern COG board meeting 
and selected Bob Smith as a representative from a larger city and Kathy Prout as a representative from a smaller city. Supervisor Scrivener and Bob Smith, as you know, are on the Kern Cog board and Kathy Prout is the alternative for Shafter, is the alternate, not alternative, alternate for Shafter, all representing the Kern Cog board. It is anticipated the first meeting of the San Joaquin Valley Multi-Agency Working Group will be in January or February of 2020. And there'll be more information coming. And this is an information item. Thank you, any questions? Seeing none, Executive Director's Report. Good evening again, uh, Mr. Chairman and Board Members. Um, Kern County Fair started uh, yesterday. We will be out there, as usual, with our booth gathering input from the public um, from the 18th to the 29th. Please come. We're right next to the Cinnamon Roll booth. Um, current Two, there's two current COG 101 uh, board training events that have been completed in the last uh, month. August 27th, we were in Shafter. Mr. Ball made a presentation, and he made a presentation earlier this afternoon from 3 to 5. He's trained uh, approximately two dozen um, elected uh, members and, and members of your staff. Uh, if if we're looking for another event, please let us know and we'll be glad to come to you or uh, put on another event here. Um, Council Member Vallejo reported on our uh, Valley Voice trip to DC last week. Uh, most successful trip probably in the last uh, six years that, 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 that I can recall. Uh, we, we also spent my time, I don't think uh, uh, Council Council Member Vallejo mentioned this, but our, our new uh, member of Congress, T.J. Cox, uh, spent time with the entire group and then um, actually had dinner with uh, Councilman Vallejo and I and, and the rest of our group and spent a good two or three hours uh, with us one-on-one, -on -one taking on us, us on a tour of the Capitol, showing us things that uh, we wother otherwise w wouldn't have had access to. Um, I, I also forgot to mention I, I did meet with uh, Congressman Cox um, and uh, Councilman Vallejo and Councilmember Smith about issues on Route 46 here in our office uh, several weeks ago. So he is fully aware of the issues that we have on 46 and hopefully uh, poised to assist us. Uh, several of you have uh, already signed up for a... Um, our meeting with SCAG that we have, uh, we try to do at least once a year, but haven't done in a couple of years. That's October 30th. Uh, we will be holding the meeting at Tohon Ranch headquarters day before Halloween. Right now we have Supervisor Couch, um, Councilman Crump, Mayor Garola, Supervisor Scribner, uh, Councilman Smith, and Councilmember Vallejo. If you would like to attend that lunch, it'll uh, probably be from start to finish about a, a four or five hour day. We'll go down there, have lunch, and have discussions with them for two, two and a half, maybe as much as three hours, and come back same day. Please, please let me know um, bef uh, maybe before uh, the week before that so we can plan on getting some vehicles to get us down there. Um, oh, this is a, an important item. So next, our next meeting is... Uh, uh, conflicts with League of California Cities Conference. Um, so uh, if there's any, I, I've already heard from Council Member Smith and Council Member Vallejo that they will be attending. Um, Council Member Smith is unable to send a alternate. Uh, so, so can we have maybe a show of hands or we can do this separately of who will be here for our October meeting and whether we need to consider rescheduling it? One, two, so, so can we raise those hands one more time? Do we have a quorum back? So those, uh, those of you that uh, cannot, okay, those of you that cannot make it, uh, can you send an alternate? So. Okay, so, so right, right now, unless we hear otherwise, we will hold the meeting because we will have a quorum. 
Se seven is a quorum. And we, we do have a speaker who's coming in from Washington, D.C., who's going to speak about the selective service. Uh, he made a presentation to us in, in D.C. And he's, he's told me that Kern County has one of, one of the lowest registration rates in the country. And I sent a note to several of you. Uh, he's going to talk to us uh, uh, about that and get the word out on what we can do to get that rate up. So 18-year-old men in this country have to register for the selective service. Okay, uh, just a couple more quick items. Next uh, Wednesday, September 25th, several of you have been invited to the Governor's Initiative Regions Rising Together. That was, um, uh, we had Aegon from the uh, Governor's Office in here a couple of months ago. This is the follow-up to that. Be held at the Chamber of Commerce. Um, if you are interested in attending, let me know. Uh, I'm not the keeper of the RSVPs, but I may be able to get you in. Uh, but I will be there, be be there too. Uh, fi my fi oh, two more. August 26, many of you attended uh, the KCAC dinner that Kern Cog hosted. Um, we had a, a distinguished speaker, Congressman Bill Thomas, who talked about transportation funding. Um, went to a, a place in Bakersfield at the municipal airport that I'd uh, never been to, the Rocket Shop Cafe. And finally, um, Rideshare Week is October 7th to the 11th. In your folder this evening is um, the changes to that one um, consent item, letter from the Board of Supervisors appointing Supervisor Scribner, a EV workshop uh, reminder for, s for next week at, current count at Fresno Council of Governments, our current Council of Governments news in advance for September with a picture of uh, the Vice President when he came and addressed our group. The referenced um, information about opportunity zones in California. A uh, flyer for uh, two electric vehicle fares, Bakersfield and Tachapi. Oh, this is very important. I'm sorry I forgot to mention this. Uh, a letter from U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation congratulating Chairman Smith on our successful completion of our every four-year certification. Thank you. Several of you have participated in that as well as staff passed with flying colors and were also commended in several areas. Thank you. Uh, schedule of cash disbursements for, for June, the Caltrans District 9 update on their projects. And uh, subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions? <coughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman. Cantu. Yes, uh, Mr. Hakimi, do we, was uh, Kern Cog involved at all or did uh, we have an opportunity to, to engage with any of the AB 617 I guess issues and things that were happening there at Shafter with that, uh, that I guess proposed legislation to, to mitigate or come up with some alternatives to mitigate air quality there? Yeah, yes, a uh, member of our staff, Linda Urata, um, has attended all, all, all of those meetings. And my understanding is when, when they are done with Shafter, they will move on to another smaller city in Kern County. And they are. Um, in the process of selecting that okay. next smaller city, but that city needs to be in the, um, as a reminder, in the Central Valley portion, not in the uh, Eastern Kern portion. Okay, so the city won't necessarily be in East in Kern. It'll be somewhere in Central Valley. It it will not be in. It will not be Tehachapi, Cal City, or Ridgecrest. Okay. okay. And it will not be Bakersfield because it's it's target it's targeting smaller cities. Okay. Would we would this um, uh, council be able to get receive an update uh, in the near future on AB six seventeen and what's and what may some of the results were from the I meetings I in Shafter? I th that's a, a great idea. I can invite the air district, who I think is the lead, and uh, maybe Supervisor Couch is a member of the air district. He might be able to comment on this. Today is the is always the day we have both those meetings. Um, so today, <coughs> the air district approved the AB six seventeen plan to forward to CARB for 
the Shafter area and for the South Fresno. And we also forwarded um, the district forwarded a recommendation to CARB that was um, to consider Stockton and the Lamont Arvin area hmm. for um, the next AB 617 process. They, we think there's only going to be three cities or three okay. areas that are selected in um, California, and maybe only one will be in the valley. So it may be it, one of those places. Okay. So, and the purpose for this, um, uh, Mr. Couch, was for them to find some mitigation solutions or op opportunities to mitigate in these yes, areas? Yes, yes. Provide and mitigation? And the, and the list... The list for the project list and, and programs are similar in some ways, but for in some ways they're very different. Some things were included in ones that weren't included in the others. But it, I think I agree it would be a good idea if we had uh, maybe Samir or somebody that he would like yeah. to bring down for that to just to, at a future meeting. To there's a lot of money at stake. Thirty eight million dollars yeah. coming to uh, just for the chapter area yeah. and projects. So, so I will good. invite the Air District to do a workshop uh, for our November meeting. Sounds good. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other member comments? Seeing none, we are adjourned.